Hello, Dr. Kath here again, and today I'd like to talk about protected wildlife in Shropshire. Now, wildlife protection has only really been in place um, since the late 1800s. That was the first nature protection law in the world was the British Parliament um, passing the 1869 Seabirds Preservation Act. And before that, when the birds were on their breeding cliffs, um, anybody could go out in a boat and shoot them and collect the eggs and um, basically totally decimate the population if they wanted to. So since then, there have been a variety of acts passed. Um, to protect wildlife in various ways. Um, the most significant of these is the Wildlife and Countryside Act from 1981. And this brought about protection for a, a great swathe of species. Um, and since then, of course, we've had other acts. We've had the uh, Wild Animals Protection Act, which is more to do with um, cruelty to animals. Which is quite, some of these things are very difficult to read. They're extremely um, complicated and extremely intricate detail. But basically, the, um, the Wild Animals Protection Act says um, it's an offence to mutilate, tick, beat, nail, or otherwise impale, stab, burn, stone, crush, drown, drag, or asphyxiate any wild mammal with intent to inflict unnecessary suffering. Now, you really hope that people wouldn't want to do any of those things anyway, but um, basically it's against deliberately in in inflicted cruelty. Then we have the Conservation of Habitats and Species Regulations from 2010. And that includes um, habitat protection and loss of biodiversity and all, all those sorts of things. It's, a, it's sort of a European directive. But basically, the protected species are listed in the schedules of the um, 1981 law and in the annexes of the 2010 laws. But offences include killing protected species, disturbing protected species, damaging the breeding and resting places of protected species and illegally trading in endangered species. They also cover various things about um, invasive species, pest species and this sort of thing. But today we're really looking at the protected species. Now, it seems odd, but birds are really well protected. There's a huge list of them in both Schedule 3 and Annex 1, and just about every bird has some protection. It was made illegal to collect eggs and disturb nesting birds in 1954. Um, since then, there have been increasing laws against it. So just about every bird, every species of bird has, has protection. Um, you're not allowed to take eggs, you're not allowed to disturb the nests. You're not allowed to photograph birds at nests without a license. Um, Natural England does license people to um, bring young birds. Um, and to photograph protected species at the nest. But generally speaking, most of us are not allowed to you know, don't go anywhere near one, basically. A lot of birds have special protection because they are rarer species, more protected species. All falcons and hawks are protected. This is a, a, a goth hawk and of course peregrines. Um, these are species that have suffered in the past from lack of protection, uh, from persecution by uh, gamekeepers and um, landowners that want to protect their, their, their game birds because the game laws came in very much earlier, and they've been with us, you know, right back into the mists of time, maybe William the Conqueror. Um, and the, the right for um, 
a landowner to protect his game. So there are special provision for, for game birds, as um, pheasants, partridge, grouse, ptarmigan, these sort of birds. Um, it used to be that, I mean, things like I mean, some species of waders were considered game birds. Bustards were game birds, but of course, bustards are extinct now, and most of the waders are thoroughly protected. Even, um, birds that don't nest in Shropshire are also protected here. So the harriers that come during the winter, um, the, out the short-eared owls that come during the winter, birds must not be direct, um, disturbed on migration, um, they must be allowed to migrate freely. So any offence against that is also a crime. It doesn't stop people. Um, there's actually been a rise in wildlife crime between 2019 and 2020. It's going up. Poisoning of um, raptors by putting out um, poison bait. Um, so for eagles and things, it tends to be carrion that's had, it, had been poisoned. And for the falcons, I mean, even last year there was a case of um, peregrines being poisoned on Clee Hill by tethered poison, uh, pigeons with poison spread on their feathers. Um, and the breeding pair of Peregrine falcons there um, died from the from the poison. They took the live birds and they died from the poison. <clears throat> Fortunately, the the young, the hatched young were um, rescued, and they survived. But it's a very poor thing to happen when these are such rare birds. There's there are there's provision for pest species of birds that can damage crops farmland, such as the, the crows, the rooks, magpies, and these sort of things. There's what was referred to as general license to um, cull these birds. However, it doesn't mean that anybody can go out and shoot as many crows and rooks as they want to. You have to have good evidence that they are causing detriment to crops or farming practice. You have to either be the landowner or have the landowner's permission. And it also has to be done in a humane way, which these days is pretty much restricted to shooting. And it, it has to be done properly. So bear in mind that even though these birds are considered the best species, they still have that protection. Mammals are covered under Schedule 8 of the 1981 Act and Annex 4A of the 2010 laws. And they include all sorts of things, some of which we have here in Shropshire. Uh, Dormice obviously are increasingly rare and they're covered under the law. Rather nice, nice little sleepy one. You have to have a license to even touch these things to disturb them at all. So, most of the monitoring of them we do through collecting nibbled nuts. Licensed people can check dormouse boxes. It's possible to put out hair tubes so the animal goes through the tube and leaves a bit of its hair stuck to the inside, which can be analyzed. So we know they're there. It's important to keep monitoring these things. It's very, all very good saying, well, it's protected, we can't go near it. But we have to know they're there. And we have to know that the population is healthy and thriving. So, yes, they can be looked at, they can be examined, but only by licensed people. It's an offence to disturb the habitat. So um, in woodlands where dormice are known to be present, you couldn't go down, cut out all the, all the coppice wood. Um, it's, it, it's also an offence to endanger any of these creatures 
not necessarily by intent, but by recklessness. So they're pretty well covered. This sort of woodland, the habitat is protected because of the species that are in it. So theoretically, there should be no threat to the living places of all these creatures. It doesn't necessarily work like that, but they have that protection. Otters are protected now. Having been a hunted species for so many years, they now have full protection. It's an offence to disturb them at their breeding sites, uh, to handle, handle them at all, to handle the cubs, to um, even, even have bits of them. You know, you can't sort of keep bits of dead otters around the place. And that goes for all of the protected species and you know who would want to the obviously there is provision if an animal is injured or in in any way suffering for it to be uplifted and taken to um, somewhere like Kewan house to be cared for and, and rehabilitated um, to be taken to a vets and to be generally cared for but there's no other excuse it's also permissible to humanely kill an animal which is obviously not going to recover so you know one that's very very badly injured um could be humanely put out of its misery but again it's the only excuse. Badgers have their own protection, um, much to the annoyance of the farmers. It you can't, of course, these were uh, targeted by um, badger baiters, badger diggers, um, set dogs set on them. They were badger baiting was seen as a sport. In consequence of this, the Badgers have their own protection. It's, I mean, they, you can't disturb the sets, you can't block the sets, and only under license. Of course, badger culling has been allowed under license because of the detriment of tuberculosis to farming. And there's lots of argument about it, but basically, most of us are not allowed to endanger in any way a badger set or a badger itself. Um, the laws provide provision for um, the, the licensed moving of um, animals and, if necessary, culling of animals where necessary. But it's very much a case of where necessary. Doesn't always help the badgers much. Um, this was the uh, scene on a, a lay-by just outside of Shrewsbury, uh, Whitchurch, and this is what I found, and it does make you wonder. Water voles are another one that's thoroughly protected, again, disturbing their habitat, disturbing their breeding places, um, capturing them in any way has to be done under license. Monitoring for um, water voles is usually by signs. We don't trap for them. We uh, check for latrines and for nibbled rushes and for burrows and plenty of signs that they've been there without actually having to handle the creatures at all or capture the creatures. So minimum disturbance and it's quite quite easy to see where they've been without disturbing them in any way. Again, you need a license to handle. Bats have their own protection. These things, are, I mean, anything that could be in the way of development has to be monitored before the development can go ahead. So in the same way as archaeological sites are protected, so are animals and their habitats. And 
the monitoring has to be done at an appropriate time of year. So there's no point sort of saying, well, I looked for bats and there weren't any there if you looked at completely the wrong time of year. If it's a hibernation site and you looked in the middle of summer, there wouldn't be any bats there, but you have to check. They, all species of bats in Britain are protected. So if you've got a bunch of them in your attic, I'm afraid you're stuck with them. They don't do any harm. They really don't. Great crested newts have had a lot of press, of course. Um, anywhere that has great crested newts in, um, again, they're protected. You, um, a lot of, um, there's a lot in the news about what they call mitigation, that if you are a development on a site that has great crested newts and whether it's possible to build them a new pond somewhere else to move them to, or in some way exclude them from the area to be developed if the pond is outside it. You have to be very, very careful with these things. In, uh, Natural England has a huge amount of regulation about it, huge amount of advice about it as well. So any of those sort of problems, that's where you go to. And they're glorious things. I mean, why we need to share our world with these things. They need to be protected. Um, you wouldn't be allowed to be completely sort of cavalier with the treatment of, of, of people. But for a long time, it was possible to ride completely roughshod over, over the needs of these animals. I wouldn't be allowed to do this apart from the fact that I was monitoring the newt at Melvie Farm in the company of one of our staff who had a license for newt handling. So this isn't me having just grabbed a newt at random. I wouldn't be allowed to do that. But because I was with somebody and doing a proper monitoring exercise, I was allowed to hold this one in my hand, which was <laughs> a great privilege. It was absolutely wonderful, but I couldn't do it on my own. I don't have a license for them. These are freshwater pearl mussels, and they've got rather a different set of problems. Um, most freshwater pearl mussels are in Scotland, but there's a small population of them down in the south of Shropshire. So this is the sort of River Clun area. And they have rather a hard life, freshwater pearl mussels. Very endangered. The larva of them have to lodge themselves in the gills of trout or salmon. And then they grow there for a while and then drop out and become adult mussels buried in the river bed. So the threat to these things isn't just the gathering of them to get the pearls. And of course, not every one of them has pearls in them. Very few of them do. But the illegal gathering of pearl mussels in Scotland has been a major problem. You have to take up lots and lots of, you know, hundreds of them to get just one or two perils. So um, the protection for them is that you're, you're not allowed to collect them anymore, but they're still suffering because the river has to be suitable for them. It has to have a very clean substrate for them to bury themselves into or they suffocate. It has to have a good stock of suitable fish for them to lodge in the gills of when they're larvae. And um, any, any form of pollution in the, the, these are filter feeders, so any form of pollution in the river is detrimental to them. So these are one really that are protected by the habitat being protected. Another one we have in Shropshire is silver studded blues. These are rare butterflies and again, thoroughly protected. They, 
absolutely glorious of things because Priestley's Common is is sort of the site for them in Shropshire. It's the only site in the West Midlands that you can see them, and they're very dependent on this lowland heath um, environment habitat. And glorious little things, but again, their habitat is really important. They're reliant on um, a species of ant to help help to, to look after basically look after the larvae, um, and, that, and that's how they that's how they breed. The larva hatches and is adopted by ants basically. And lots of the blues do this. But you have to have the right habitat, you have to have the right kind of ant. So these are protected um, not only from collectors, of course, collecting butterflies used to be a big, big hobby, but also from the dis disruption of the habitat, which is equally important. Plants have a slightly thinner time of it. Um, they're not quite so well protected. There is there are laws against um, digging up wild plants anywhere apart from your own land. There are certain species that you can't even dig up on your own land. This is a, a lady slipper orchid because we don't have these in Shropshire. They're very much northern species, and these were driven almost to extinction in the UK by collection. Now, plants, the problems with, with plants tends to be um, either somebody digging up the odd one because surely it doesn't really matter. There's lots of them aren't there. I'd like that in my garden. Sort of casual sort of thing. There's the large scale taking of them for resale. And I mean, that includes things like snowdrops and butterflies and fritillaries and um these plants you get in, in in large numbers. And there's also the sort of collector thing that people want to have that particular rare species in their garden or sell it to somebody that wants it in their garden. So it, it's a bit like the collection of birds' eggs, but that can drive some of these very rare species, these um, ones that tend to be quite scattered. I mean, things like the lady slippers orchids, the red helleborines, the ghost orchids, lizard orchids, things like this, could drive them to extinction. So they are thoroughly protected. The only trouble is that it's very, very hard to police the, these rare species because, I mean, they're, they're, they're static. They can be... Taken is not, not like plants, you know, not, not animals and birds. So you don't need to trap them, they're just sitting there. You can go and do all you need is a garden trowel. But the protection is there for them. And if you get caught with them, um, or caught trying to sell one, or um being involved in the collection of them, you're in trouble. We don't we, we don't have those very rare species in Shropshire, but we do have things like the um the bluebells. These wonderful bluebell woods. Only last year, again, there was um, a prosecution. Must have been the year before, prosecution of um, a group of people who had taken something like eight thousand bluebell bulbs <clears throat> from the wild, and these are for sale to gardeners. So, taking things from the wild and selling them to other people exchanging them with other people is definitely a no-no. You know, sackfuls of these, you know, stripping out woods of these beautiful, the absolutely beautiful bluebells, um, taking them away so the rest of us can't enjoy them. You know, if you go to a place where you go every year to see the bluebells or to see the orchids or whatever, and somebody else has come and helped themselves to them, you're going to feel aggrieved. You know, you, 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 they're taking away an essential part of that woodland and leaving the things that rely on them bereft. So these laws are there for a purpose. And it might seem a bit bonkers uh, if you've got thousands of buttercups, you say, well, why would you worry about a few hundred? But everyone counts and every little bit that is taken away 
is one bit less for things to thrive in. So these laws are there for a purpose. The protection of habitats tends to be under schemes like the um, SSSIs, the, the, the look at special scientific interests, sites for special scientific interests, like the mosses, um, like the um, lowland fens. Um, these in, endangered, what are endangered habitats? And these are places where there is a suite of very specialized creatures living. So these are protected by Natural England under the SSSI scheme. Wildlife site schemes, it's slightly less, you know, areas of slightly less importance, but are still recognized as important. Any sort of um, appellation they put to a particular area helps to protect it. The difficulty is it doesn't completely protect it. And as we've seen from um, particularly like the, the, the HS2 railway development, um, large infrastructure projects like that um, can very easily get round any law against disturbing these protected areas. So, you know, they've been putting it through ancient woodlands and all sorts of things. And local pressure groups have been complaining about it, but it's still happening. So, whether more protection would help, I don't know, because they seem to be able to get through that. Personally, I would like to say, I'd say SSSI's um, reserves, that sort of thing totally sacrosanct, totally, um, you know, no way you could develop anything anywhere near its sort of job, but um, it doesn't necessarily work like that. But it's what we have and it's what we need to work with. So looking after these sites is really important and Natural England support landowners that own SSSIs, they tell them why they're SSSIs, what needs to be done, what management is, is appropriate and what is necessary. So the laws are there to protect endangered habitats too. Also to um, prevent loss of biodiversity through, through development and through um, changes in the way areas are managed. And any sort of recognition of somewhere as a, as a valuable site is always a good thing it's always going to be helpful when somebody looks at the site and says oh, well, i can build a factory there or i could extend a railway across it or a road or whatever it has legal status it has legal protection so anything that's new designation of wildlife sites for example should be encouraged another of our reserves that's an ssi this is melvely meadows um, a species rich grassland, um, traditional hay meadow habitat. It, we've lost 98% of it since, since the last war. And this is, these are rare fragments and they need to be protected. The law is there to protect them. So, what can you do to help? This is West Mercia. Police Wildlife Crime Unit exists to protect wildlife. So anything you see when you're out, when you're walking, anything you see that you think might possibly be endangering some sort of wildlife, whether it's birds of prey or whether it's a rare habitat or um, whether it's those silver studded blue butterflies, any of those sort of things, do get in touch with the Wildlife Crimes Unit. You've, you can find out online, you can do it online, you can phone them up. Um, please don't get involved. If you see some you know, a group of people at, at where you know a badger set is, please don't get involved, but do phone 999. Tell them what's going on.
we don't have policemen on the beat in the countryside. Uh, sort of walking around with their, their hats on and that, sort of checking out on wildlife crime. The police need the public to be their eyes and ears. So anything you're not you, that makes you uncomfortable about the countryside, you see something that doesn't look right. You see, um, you know, if, for example, you know that dead bird lying next to a piece of carrion. That's going to be worrying. Anything like that, set the alarm bells ringing, get in touch with West Mercia Wildlife Crime Unit. They need us to help. Of course, the other thing you can do to help is to make sure there's plenty of reserves, plenty of spaces available, that farmers are helping the wildlife and being advised in the right way. So all these things are things that Shropshire Wildlife Trust are involved in. So another way of helping is join Shropshire Wildlife Trust so we can look after good big areas where all these rare species and the common species as well can thrive and multiply and spread out through the rest of the county. So have a think about it. And when you spend at least five minutes thinking about it, then go online and join us. Brilliant. Thank you so much.